Remember that Christmas truce in World War I where the, uh, the Allies and the Germans put down their guns and they threw a Christmas party? When it was all over, they refused to go back to war with each other. And this is the reason why, I don't know if you noticed this, uh, uh, on whatreallyhappened.com today, I put up a whole series of videos about Iran and the Iranian people and what they really look like and what their, their land really looks like so that you have to look at them face to face because if you're looking them in the eyes, it becomes a lot harder to hate them and kill them on command. And so would you please continue reading what you were talking about, uh, this, this propaganda from history? Yes, Michael. Again, this is 1938, an average British citizen going on a tour his boat arrives in Hamburg, Germany. Since that day when I arrived in Germany, I have talked to many Germans of both sexes, but not one have I met who showed the least sign of hatred or bitterness against our country or its peoples. I have come to the conclusion that if the foul propaganda, vile accusations, and lies that are poured out of the government-controlled presses of the nations during wartime were to be stopped, Strife between such educated peoples would be impossible. That is, a, quote. that is an absolutely wonderful quote, and it's absolutely true, which is, of course, what we're trying to do here on Republic Broadcasting and uh, my website. We're basically trying to let people know that what you're hearing from the corporate media to sell you a war is absolutely a lie. All wars are started with lies. Everything they're saying today about Iran is a repeat of what they were saying about Iraq back in 2003. They're building nuclear weapons. They're coming to kill us. They're evil. We must strike first. It's the same thing that uh, Hitler was doing at Gleiwitz. Uh, this kind of preemptive war uh, it just keeps you know, going. This was Israel's excuse to attack Egypt. Oh, they're coming to get us. And they went and, and, and bombed Egypt. And Egypt said, wait a minute, we weren't planning anything like that. Well, we had to be sure. And, you know, when we have like Tucker Carlson over there on Fox saying, oh, well, not Tucker Carlson, but the guy who was with him on the, on the video saying the U.S. is the only country with the moral authority to wage preemptive war. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. But we're seeing the ramping up of this propaganda to go into Iran. It's reached an almost panicked, hysterical uh, degree to where I think even the hardcore Fox News viewers are, are going to be uh, pulling back and saying, wait a minute, this, this doesn't feel genuine anymore. It doesn't feel objective. It's just this constant hard sell. And what I am sensing between uh, the Ariel, uh, not the, uh, the uh, Shimon Perez story where he's coming to meet uh, Obama before Netanyahu does, and they're talking about maybe pulling back from this situation. We're almost seeing one half of both governments pull back away from this war with Iran because it's a really bad idea and it could lead to an open, outright global world war. And then we're seeing the fanatics who are desperate for the war just trying to ramp up the, the, the propaganda all that much higher. And the, the dangerous situation that we face here is that those who see war as the only solution to their own problems, they're going to do anything it takes to get that war going. And that is where it really gets dangerous. Are we looking at a new false flag? We know that there's a lot of, of uh, signals uh, gathering around that whole March 7th, March 8th time frame when Purim starts and the FBI is going to start unplugging websites and all this other stuff going on here. We know that our government is desperate to get into a war, so the American people will not blame the coming second major economic crash on the government, even though they're to blame. Uh, we know uh, Netanyahu needs a war to hold on to power in his country. His, he's starting to lose support in the Knesset. 50% of the Israeli people don't want this war with Iran. They know Iran does have the capability to strike at Israel. This whole Iron Dome missile that we all paid for, their missile defense system, doesn't seem to work much better than Patriot did. And yes, and, and Michael, um, I don't know if you saw the article that was in the New York Times on Monday, but it said um, by its very nature, it, um, if Israel attacks, it cannot be a limited uh, war, that, that they will need refueling and all kinds of assistance and at least 100 planes just to hit the five major nuclear or potential nuclear facilities that Iran has, mm -hmm. which means... As, as soon as they start, it's automatically involving the United States. Well, unfortunately, the United States, back during the administration of George W. Bush, uh, repeated and reiterated its uh, commitment that it would join Israel in a war against Iran, even if Israel struck 
first. So there is no question that if Israel starts the war with Iran, they are expecting and counting on American children to be put out front as bullet stoppers, you know, to protect their own precious children from the retaliation. That's been their plan all along. That's why I really thought that they were pushing really hard to try and get this war with Iran going while the American kids were still in Iraq to basically act as uh, road bumps for the uh, Iranian retaliation. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very ugly situation. The people who are planning on starting the war, they're not planning to be the ones to have to fight it or finish it. They just want to get it going for their own p- particular political expediency or economic reasons. Thanks so much, Michael. All right. It's Thanks an awful lot it. for the call. All right. Yeah, and like I said, I know you're all tired of hearing me go on and on about propaganda in Iran, uh, but... Uh, To me, this is the most important story that's out there right now. The fact that we're going to possibly get dragged into a for real world war, America against Russia and China, all because of little tiny Israel. And Israel is doing it because they're listening to their imaginary playmate in the sky. Or they're doing it because they're just jealous of all the other nations around them. Uh, They're screaming about Iran's nuclear power. It's got nothing to do with bombs and weapons. Because if Iran had a nuclear bomb, in all seriousness, would they use it against the United States? Of course not. The United States has the world's largest nuclear arsenal. Would they use it against Israel? No. Israel has three to 400 warheads plus the assistance of the United States of America. The reason why Israel views a nuclear Iran as a problem has to do with profit, not war. Israel is the only nuclear technology in the Middle East at the present time, except, of course, for Iran's uh, newly born program. Israel has been caught selling nuclear weapons or trying to sell a nuclear weapon to South Africa. And earlier today, we stumbled across another article that said Israel may have sold nuclear weapons technology they acquired from the United States at taxpayer expense to China. Well, Israel can charge whatever they want for that technology because there's no competition. But all of a sudden, if Iran shows up and they're selling at least the peaceful nuclear technology, then Israel has to start cutting its prices. And Israel doesn't want to do that. And there's another part of it having to do with this very kind of sick jealousy, and I've talked about this before. Israel's entire justification for stealing Palestine from the Palestinians and living on it is all in the Old Testament of the Bible or the Torah, which tells a story of these amazing kingdoms of David and Solomon and this amazing first temple, which nobody has ever found any archaeological evidence to support. It's just not there. The two artifacts that were supposed to prove the existence of the first temple, the uh, staff pomegranate ornament and the uh, Jehoash tablet, both turned out to be frauds, executed by one Oded Golan, who's made himself rich making fake religious artifacts to sell to the Bible bangers around the world. And yet you look around places like Iran and Iraq and Egypt and all those other areas, Saudi Arabia, all over the desert, and you can't take a step without tripping over the artifacts of the ancient civilizations. Ancient Egypt's artifacts are everywhere. I mean, cows in pastures stumble over mummies. They found another uh, one of the great temples like Karnak trying to dig for a sewer line down there. I mean, you, you just bump into the stuff all over the place. And yet in Israel, there is nothing about this mythical kingdom of David and Solomon. They may have just been living in tents and just been two more nomadic leaders of no tremendous import that have been in sort of inflated over the, uh, the, the, the generations. But I honestly feel that Israel is very jealous of all those other countries who have such archaeological riches because it continues to underscore the fact that there is no scientific proof for Israel's claims of having been on the land originally. And even the argument about we should return the land to who it originally belonged to is a kind of a weak because the Hittites had it before the Hebrews and the Hyksos. So it's, it's a situation where Israel culturally is not only paranoid, they're very insecure. They're very insecure. And they want to present themselves as the, as the most powerful and sophisticated and cultured uh, nation in, in that part of the world. And yet when you look over at Iran where Tehran has just been there 3,000 years continuously. I and mean, it's a beautiful city, very clean. And I think Israel is just jealous, and that's a really dumb reason to start a war. We'll be right back after these commercials. Here is your host, Michael Rivero. And aloha, America. Welcome back to our show here. It's Friday. Thank goodness it's Friday. We're kind of uh, relaxed and a little bit loose here. Even with the, the threat of war hanging over our heads, I'm kind of glad it's the weekend here and uh, looking forward to spending some time with my lovely wife, Claire. We're going to go back to the phones. Peter in Las Vegas. Aloha, Peter. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Uh, welcome to RBN. This is my first call since you moved. Oh, uh, well, thank you. 
Uh, hey, uh, Michael, you're talking about Israel, and, and, and the, the reason, I think, the main reason that uh, Israel has such a Jones on for Iran uh, is that basically, uh, you know, the whole Yeretz Israel thing, they, they've mm-hmm. stolen land from virtually everybody. Uh, they refuse to draw their borders after 65 or so years. Mm-hmm. Uh, with uh, a nuclear Iran, which does not pose a threat, as you rightly say, uh, but what it does is that an alliance system could spring up backed by Iran that, that would deter them from aggressively stealing their, uh, all the land they want for this year as Israel. You thing. are exactly correct. That is the real issue. And Iran with a nuclear weapon, it's going to be a lot more difficult to go in and invade and take control of the oil fields. It's going to be a lot more difficult to invade and force them to use a private central bank. And it's going to be a lot more difficult for Israel to project its power and grab land anywhere in the Middle East if there is a, a, a pan-Arab alliance centered around Iran. And that's what Israel is really afraid of. And, it doesn't, and, and they're perfectly willing to throw as many young American men and women into the problem as it takes to solve it. It's a sacrifice. You know, many of you may die, but it's a sacrifice we are willing to make. Uh, and, and then when you figure that, that, uh, that uh, if it's a nuclear deterrent that, that, that uh, impedes them, then also uh, Iran, you know, with a population of, what, 60 million or something, one out of ten people they could mobilize in a pinch. Yes. Israel could, seven million could do 700,000, but the Iranians could do six, six million. It would be more and, than that and, because uh, they'd be fighting uh, for their own home. Ten. Yeah, Peter, it'd be more yeah. than, it would be more than that because the Iranians would be fighting for their own home. I mean, have we all forgotten the lesson of Vietnam, you know, where the U.S. went in with all this modern high-tech weaponry and all these soldiers and everything, and the Vietnamese people were fighting with, with pitchforks and bush knives and, and bamboo stakes, and they succeeded in winning. And, they were... and, and also, Mike, the, 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 the Israel's uh, uh, continuing bellicosity yes. uh, against Iran uh, uh, has driven them. Uh, obviously, they've got the, the, the Chinese and the Russians have had enough of it as well, and so they're tacitly back there as well. So it will be. It, it's already uh, their bellicosity against Iran has already realigned the Middle East hugely to the disfavor of the United States. Oh, that's absolutely correct. I mean, before Israel came along, the United States was very well entrenched in the Middle East, had a lot of deals, a lot of commerce, a lot of oil flowing back and forth. Uh, We had a lot of friends in those countries in the Middle East, and Israel, since it came into existence, has worked to sabotage the relationship between the United States and every other nation in the region. That's why today they keep saying Israel is America's only friend in the Middle East. That's because they've gone out and played these dirty tricks like the Levon affair to, to sabotage and poison America's friendship with every other country in the region. And they've got their, their fifth columnist, like Lieberman, with this new bill where we're not even allowed to think about talking with Iran. I mean, who don't you talk with? You talk with everybody. Why not? What's that bother? What's that hurt? And we can't even, they've, they've uh, legislatively, they're owning of our legislative process, Israel's owning of our Congress and president, frankly, has totally foreclosed on any possibility almost short of war. They well, that was, that was a, the goal. That was the goal. Corner where we're not even allowed, because Israel says we're not allowed to talk to them. So it's either World War Three or nothing. Yeah, that's exact. Well, that's what Israel wants. And and I want to put out the warning right now. And a lot of people used to think I was crazy for saying this. And now I get a lot of email from folks saying, you might be right about this one. Israel would be perfectly happy if the United States and Russia and China annihilated each other, because that would leave Israel with their nuclear arsenal basically in control of what was left of the world. I agree with you, uh, Michael. That's a definite possibility. That's, Yeah, that's a that's. Definite possibility. Well, that's been Israel's. Not- that's been Israel's method all along. I mean, when it's on a personal level, psychiatrists call it playing. Let's you and him fight. You know, with little tiny people who have, who can only find empowerment by tricking other people into fighting each other. And it's a little psychological game they love to play. Now we've got Israel, which is about half the size of New Jersey, and they're out there constantly goading other people to fight and destroy each other. And then Israel sits back and laughs, and they make a lot of money loaning money uh, for war and selling weapons. 
I mean, uh, Israel gets so many weapons given to it by the United States of America that three quarters of their own military production is for export. And it, it's just, it, yeah, it's it, it's just a huge ongoing scam. And when you try and point it out that they're just scamming everybody, they go, oh, you're Hitler, you're an anti-Semite, you hate the Jewish people, you this and you that. And the, and the media just goes along with it. Anytime anybody stands up to challenge Israel, the media will just pile on and say, ooh, you're a bad, evil, smelly person. Although, thankfully, I think that's, that's beginning to morph. They've uh, worn change, it out. Uh, they, they've worn it out. They've worn it out. You know, 10, 10 years ago, uh, or 20 years ago, they'd say, you're an anti-Semite, and people would cower and everything. And these days, they say, you're an anti-Semite, and it's like, okay, big deal. <laughs> you know. And their attempts at false flags are, are being questioned all the time. Yeah, they, they've lost that. We've got to take a break for commercials. Stay on the line. We'll let you talk for a few more minutes on the other side of this commercial break. 